good? Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Standing. So I play the bass, which is the largest of all the string instruments. And over the years when I was teaching public school, I noticed that a number of youngsters who were 10 and 12 and 13 years old were getting injured when they played. So I started thinking to myself as I went on into higher education, there's got to be a way for me to impart information on these youngsters so as they grow and they change and they develop, they can maximize their mechanical efficiency and prevent injury. So while I was working on my doctorate, I did spend one year studying industrial systems engineering, ergonomic design, kinematics, and biomechanics at Ohio State University. And I, of course, was the only music major ever to walk in the building, which was kind of interesting and a great deal of fun. And I learned a lot. And one of the things that I learned about the situation is that there is a lot of things that we hold in common with the sciences that we in music would prefer not to mention, but I'm going to mention them all this afternoon. So one of the things that is fundamental to everything that we do is how we set up our body, i.e. our posture. So I study bass players in particular about how you set up your anatomy. We know that there are certain aspects of our functioning physically that if they're not correct, our technique suffers, our, we tend to be tired more often, we tend to set ourselves up for a risk of injury. So we're going to talk about how I developed this. So what I, I looked at was what we can do to our bodies and how we can set up our body in such a way that we will set ourselves up for the most mechanically advantageous positions possible. Interestingly enough, I stole, literally, a, uh, a architectural concept of framing. Everybody knows what an I-beam is, correct? An I-beam essentially holds up the building that we're standing in, correct? You don't see them, but they are there. And an I-beam gets its structural integrity from the vertical part, correct? The center of the eye. But then there are also parts across the top that allow you to support other structures. So what I did was I came up with a two-dimensional posture theory that I have been testing out for the last 20 years, and it's still a very viable research tool, and it's a way to think about setting your anatomy up so that when you do anything from cut the grass, I know you do a lot of that, um, snow shoveling, which you probably do more of here in Cleveland, not to mention the fact of uh, vacuuming, playing your instrument, playing tennis, playing football, anything that you do, or even sitting at your desk. I used this architectural concept and came up with the IV posture theory. So the I-beam essentially exists on your anatomy, as I tell my elementary students, it's your nose to belly button line, is your center of the I-beam, across is your, the, the top part is your shoulders, and then across the bottom is your hips. Now, interestingly enough, my I-beam looks pretty good, but if I were to stand up here like this, my I-beam doesn't look so good, does it? And what happens is when the structure is not uh, put together correctly, your body doesn't work the way it's supposed to. So for example, in my opinion, I beam stands for integrity of the anatomy. Most musical instruments that we play uh, require our arms to do all kinds of things. Okay, everybody stand up for me, because I know you've been hanging out and sitting down. I want you to demonstrate really poor posture. So I would like, please, if you would kind of slump in your center, so that your center is like this, and you're just kind of slumped around. Now I want you to try to move your arms a lot, without hitting your neighbor. Right, now I want you to stand up correctly. Now try to move your arms. It's a lot easier, isn't it? But what happens is we have two kinds of posture. You can sit down now. You really look funny, I have to tell you. <laughs> so one of the things that's interesting to me is, is that we don't realize sometimes when we are in intense situations. Oh, you're working on a paper. You're sitting over your laptop, and all of a sudden you look like this. <laughs> right? This happens without even thinking about it because we are so intense. The problem is, is that we know about muscle dynamics and how brain motion, or rather brain and muscles communicate with each other, that after a certain amount of time, if you continually do this, the brain is going to think that every time you look at your laptop, you're supposed to do this, right? We know about programming motions, right? All of you guys probably had lunch today, right? One of the gentlemen over here has a plate of something, right? But not anymore, obviously. But did you at any time when you were eating your plate of whatever it was, think about your fork? 
absolutely not. Because the fork has been programmed, so it's a conditioned response. He sees the spaghetti or whatever it is, and in it goes, he's having a conversation with his colleagues. Because that particular motion has been now programmed into his brain. And what happens in music and what happens in anything we do that involves motion is it becomes what I call a muscular vocabulary. Okay, and it gets imprinted into the brain and we don't even think about it. So if you learn how to eat like this, <laughs> and you're 25, you would continue to eat like this. Right? And so what I tried to do was look at musicians and how that, that information is imprinted into the brain and then how efficient it is. We all know when we've learned something wrong. Remember when you learned somebody's phone number wrong before you had cell phones? You probably don't remember before you had cell phones. But we had rotary dial phones. We had to memorize numbers. And if you memorize the number wrong, you were always calling somebody that you didn't expect. And then you had to unlearn that number and relearn the right number. And that's where the problem is for musicians. So I set up this posture theory. Again, so we have the I-beam across and down. The second aspect of the I-beam is called vertical orientation of the torso, right? Have you ever tried to breathe like this? It doesn't work so well, right? The whole idea, believe it or not, for those of you in physics or in biomechanics, are in our trunk, which starts here where your femur hits your hip, all the way up to here, has the same mechanical properties as a cylinder. So it's kind of fun. But that means the cylinder doesn't bend in here, does it? When you want to bring your trunk forward, you have to bring it forward this way. Okay? Most people try to bend where their belt is, as opposed to where their body should bend, which is down here. And this is a big deal when you sit at your desks with your computers, or you do other things that involve this. People do a lot of that stuff, and that's a problem. The next part of the criteria is that the trunk moves, as we discussed, from here. Okay? The spine is one long thing, and it's really important that these things are, are together in the respect that you move it as a unit, because if you start to do this, you start to, do, you start to impact your invertebral discs, right? Everybody understands how the spine works, correct? It's bones, and then in between each of your spine, your vertebra, as we call them, are little discs, okay? Those invertebral discs are interesting because they do not have a blood supply, and they don't have any sensation. So what happens is, is that there's a sheath that is surrounding the invertebral disc that takes in nutrients, okay? And what happens is, is if you injure your disc, that sheath gets a little scar tissue. And if you continue to injure that disc, the scar tissue mounts, and it, the amount of surface area that there is for nutrients to penetrate into the invertebral disc gets smaller and smaller and smaller, and then at some point the invertebral disc fails, and you have two vertebrae right on top of each other. And so that's exactly what happens with spine injuries for a lot of people. Barring any major physical accident, you've been doing something ridiculously stupid for the last 20 years. You've had no pain whatsoever, and all of a sudden you wake up and go, oh no, I can barely move. That's exactly what happened. Okay, and musicians are famous for this because we set ourselves in the posture and we play for a long time, and we're not paying attention. We're paying attention to Mozart, we're not paying attention to the mechanics that actually gets Mozart to happen, okay? So then the last three points of my postural criteria have to do with your head over your spine. In other words, when you try to breathe like this, it doesn't work so well. Violinists and violists are famous for this, right? I'm going to hold up my instrument like so, and then they wonder why they're tired at the end of 10 minutes because all of a sudden they're not taking in enough oxygen. So the head has to be an extension of the eye and the last two points of, of the posture theory have to do with the, our orientation of the arms. Most people need to keep an alignment, no matter what you do, from your middle finger through your wrist to your elbow, and then the whole upper body segment into the wrist. So it doesn't matter if you're playing tennis. It doesn't matter if you're playing basketball. What you want to avoid is this kind of stuff, the, the I say extreme motions, because what that does is, try this for a minute. Take your right hand and put it as far down as you can. Try to move your fingers. Fast. Is that fun? Not. Do this. Now move them. Go the other way. Move them. Not so good, right? So when you sit there and you're trying to like do typing and you're, it's one o'clock in the morning and you're laying in bed like this, and you wonder why my typing isn't so fabulous, that's probably why it is. And so the idea is if we think about alignment as a basic vocabulary of life, it'll be easier for you to do just about everything, not just music. All right, so one of my assistants here is going to pass out um, <clears throat> a little Sam the Skeleton here.
I wrote down the posture criteria, and I want you to take exactly 35 seconds once you get this to evaluate yourself. Now, I'm looking at a lot of you and I see some things. Now, one of the reasons why we want the head over the shoulders is because your mechanical functioning just diminishes by 10% for each 5% we move the head forward in terms of how much oxygen you're able to take. And I'm watching everybody go, okay. <laughs> the other thing we have to address is also the conflict that exists because our spine wants to be very vertical, but it's more comfortable when you're sitting in a chair to lean slightly forward, okay? So what, what's good about that is, is that you should listen to what your body says and change your position. So don't always play in this or, or sit in the same position forever. For those of you guys that spend a lot of time in front of a computer screen, you might, you might you know, trade in your chair for a fitball. You know what a fitball is? Fitballs are way fun, but I caution you, the first day is a little trying you can fall off and be careful <laughs> because they move around and you have to like get used to them, all right? The other thing you consider is also a standing desk or changing your position. I have a, a basically a rubber-made tote. I keep my laptop on. Sometimes I sit and sometimes I stand. And it, I, so during the day, I'm not in one static posture. Okay, so the idea of the posture theory is that there are two kinds of posture theory or two kinds of postures. One is static, and you guys are in a static posture, which is not a Right? Then you go to do something, and we call that a dynamic posture. And it's great. You look terrific until all of a sudden you're standing in front of a group of people to present, and you go, oh dear. Right? So you have to pay attention to these criteria even when you are moving. So if you're playing tennis, you guys all watch tennis, right? When they move around, they keep their trunk. Even when they're doing a backhand, they're always keeping the shoulder line together and moving back to the center of the court because, again, it's a postural type of situation. One of the interesting things about musicians is that they oftentimes injure themselves inadvertently. And think about it, particularly our tall gentlemen in the room. Some of you guys are very tall, and some of you guys sitting, the desks are not the right height, correct? And it's difficult for you to do stuff. So don't be afraid to adjust your chair, adjust the height of the desk or whatever, they invented things like bricks. You can lift up the desk and do this kind of stuff. I mean, I've looked at musicians who, because they're too tall, their, their knees go into pianos and all these kinds of things. And, and it's, who decided the height of a piano? I ask you. Obviously, Mr. Steinway, in whatever year he designed a piano, decided that there is a particular height for the keyboard of a piano. Now, I could call Steiner and say we need telescoping legs, but that would probably not go over so well. But the idea is, is that if the bench doesn't work for you, you need to find something that does. For you to be at your best, and it doesn't matter for the record what you do. I happen to study musicians, but I will tell you that a lot of office workers, if you look at carpal tunnel syndrome, you look at low back problems, you look at these kinds of things which are rampant in the business world, these are all because of a lot of them are, are major uh, I guess outgrowths of poor posture. Okay, the other thing we'll talk about is the dreaded backpack. I have seen some backpacks on students that probably weigh about 250 pounds, right? And they're walking like this or whatever. So you need to figure out how to deal with that so that you can minimize the stress on your anatomy. The bottom line is, is that if you have bad posture when you're 20, by the time you get to be my age, it gets worse. And then when you get to be older than that, it could be debilitating broken hips, broken, all sorts of stuff. So it's the thing to think about. Now take a look at your handout, and you can see Sam the skeleton. Sam is just one of my very good friends. We travel a lot together. And you can see that he shows you the eye beam. What's interesting about this is you can see the, the clavicles in the front are the top of the eye beam structure, and then at the bottom it's the base of the pelvis. We call those your ischial tubercytes, uh, for those of you who are in anatomy class. And the idea is, is that when you sit, that's where you should be sitting on. Oftentimes referred to in some kinds of yoga and or Alexander technique as your sit bones. And these are kind of really important things. So the idea is, is that when you sit, you need to sit there, which means that your legs have to actually bend up. Now, there are also differences in the genders between how we set up anatomy. For example, gentlemen tend to hold their uh, center of gravity higher more in the sternum area, and for girls, our center of gravity is in the hips. Um, and so you have to be careful when you think about cantilevers and you think about doing things. So guys, you want to sit further back in the chair than ladies do, um, and ladies will probably sit further front in the chair than guys do. It all depends on the application of what you're working on. 
Um, but I think the important thing about this two-dimensional model is it's six points that you can just go boom, 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 and check, and then you're all squared away. Remember that the, the mechanical performance of the anatomy has everything to do with several factors. One has to do with the actual physical shape, one has to do with oxygen, and the third has to do with position relative to what we're doing. So when you're sitting at your computer, that's one work environment. When you're playing violin or cello or bass or piano, that is another work environment. When you're watching television, even though you don't think about it, that is another work environment. And oftentimes when we're not thinking about it, we start to do this. Okay, and that, the, the, I guess the toll this takes on your musculature is not a good thing. So I would ask if anyone has any questions. And then we'll, we're going to see how you do on your uh, eye beam. So I want you to take your neighbor and take 30 seconds and look at your eye beam and see if you guys match and if you meet the criteria. Think about it. Okay, so now, as we go forward for the last couple of minutes, were there differences between the genders? Did girls have different problems than the boys had with respect to the criteria? Yes or no? Oh, don't jump, people. Everyone's sitting up like I like got your grandmother in that time. You have to we're going in your Sunday go to meet where, right? But the idea is, when you sit up, do you, do you notice the difference in oxygen? Okay, when you think you might fall asleep in a, a class, this is when you really gotta sit up straight. Because this is what happens, you sit there and you go like this, you don't get enough oxygen and then you get tired. So these are the kinds of things to think about. So I'm gonna leave you with the six basic postural criteria with the idea that I would like you to, to use it in good health, to enjoy pain-free, wonderful days, and so that you don't set yourself up for injury. And the other, the last thing I would say is, is that as you move forward with looking at your own posture, I want you to think about how the static posture or seated posture interacts, if you will, with what you do in your daily life, whether it's, whether you're in a, in a lab. I have seen some rather unique postures of people trying to pour things in test tubes and whatever else not. Think about that as well, because if you do that activity for a very long period of time, that muscular vocabulary, again, gets imprinted into the brain, and then you set yourself up at a risk for injury. Okay? In music, just so you know, I'll give you some basic statistics so you can frame this. 76% of orchestral musicians that they studied, they studied about 2,000 musicians over a period of five years, 76% of that population did have a performance injury which was significant enough for them to actually miss two weeks of the performance season. Now, if you take any professional team and they had that kind of injury statistics, there would be a major wholesale change. But because musicians are a little bit different and oftentimes they've delayed to get treatment in these kinds of things and they don't think about basic body mechanics, they end up contributing to their own injury. So I know this sounds like a really basic thing, Sort of like, it's not very sexy to think about posture, I get it. You know, it's like, you don't tell people when you get a new furnace, you tell them when you get a new car, even though they may cost the same, right? Because who cares about your furnace, right? But the thing about posture is it's something that you live in every single day, and it will make a big difference going forward as you continue to do the work, the daily work of your life. And the other thing is, is please try to avoid, if you can, those repeated injury things of the spine, because when the injury does happen, it's generally debilitating, and it can be the end. It can be a career ender, and that does, doesn't mean for music. Okay. So, anyone have any questions about the, the two-dimensional eye beam posture theory? So, I would ask you folks to use it in good health. Questions? I guess not.